a little more what that's about. Uh, the Anchor Group Fair is uh, us as a church. We a desire for you to go from the step of us here at worship into the next step of being connected and devoted into a small group. And so you're going to meet all our small group leaders this morning. Uh, that'll be happening a little bit later. But please, you can go uh, after, after the service, the service and, and sign up, up talk, talk to them. To them. I, think I think some of them, some of them have brownies. brownies. They're, They're trying to entice, to entice you. you. So that's, so that's a, good a good move, move I think. I think. Applaud them. them. Um, but, but just, uh, we're, we're looking, looking for people, for people uh, like you to join and be able connected into a small group. It's only a six week commitment. And so uh, if you uh, love it, you can keep going after that. If you need a different shift in life, you can do that after six weeks. So that's happening today after the service. The other thing that's happening today is for our new people, uh, we're having the uh, compass class and that's happening next door in the multi-purpose room. If you are a new person here, uh, if you haven't really stepped into the next step at Southport Church, then we would love for you to join us uh, next door uh, after service. After you sign up for an anchor group, walk on down and get to know us a little bit more. There is light lunch provided for you, those of you who come, and we love just to get to know, know you more and let you know what's happening in our church and how you can plug in. And then something that I'm really excited about as well is uh, next Sunday night on the 27th, uh, Pastor Nick, our family life pastor, he's going to be kicking off um, the launch, which is our youth group, which is our, it's an anchor group as well. Um, and uh, Pastor Nick is really focusing on student leadership. He's focusing on our, our students getting involved and finding ways to volunteer and have community hours, uh, which I think a lot of students need now. And so there's a lot of things that, uh, there's really seven checkpoints that we teach our kids. You can see them up there, Others First, Ultimate Authority in God, Spiritual Disciplines, Moral Boundaries, Authentic Faith, Healthy Friendships, and Wise Choices. That's what our students are learning. And so uh, we'd love for you, if you have um, a student, uh, to join us on the 27th uh, Sunday night with Pastor Nick. And so, so those are our announcements. And this morning we have something a little extra we get to move into installing a couple of new members with us this morning. And uh, I'd like to invite Pastor Michael up. And I'd also like to invite uh, Miss Jill Goodnight and Miss Paula Baum to join me up here this morning. Yes. And they took our membership class uh, this last Wednesday. We offer that every month uh, here at Southport. And uh, oh, you want to be on the other side of me? Okay, that works. That's fine. We'll and I'll do, yeah, you'll flank me. I'll, I'll be able to rotate. <laughs> um, so I've gotten to know these ladies uh, for the last a year or two, and so it's been great to get to know them more. Uh, they're involved in lots of ways in the church already, and so we're just thankful that they're taking that next step to be uh, members of our church. And so uh, with our church meeting happening next month, that's a great opportunity for them to exercise their vote and continue to be involved and invested but we get the chance now to install them as members. And so I'm gonna read uh, just the installation service and I'm gonna ask a couple questions of you, of you two and I'll let you know what the answer is. It's not a quiz, don't worry. <laughs> so let me read this. The privileges and blessings that we have in association together in the Church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious to us. There is in it such hallowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness as brotherly and sisterly watch care and counsel as can be found only in the church. There is the godly care of pastors with the teachings of the word and the helpful inspiration of corporate worship. And there is cooperation in service, accomplishing that which could not otherwise be done. And the doctrines upon which this church rests are essential to the Christian experience and they are brief. And they are that we believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we especially emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin and that they need the work and forgiveness through Christ and the new birth by the Holy Spirit. That subsequent to this, there is a deeper work of heart cleansing or entire sanctification through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that to each of these works of grace the Holy Spirit gives witness. And we believe that our Lord will return, that the dead shall be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and its punishments. Do you heartily believe in these truths and in so, 
answer, I do. I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and do you realize that he saves you now? Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> good. So far, so good, everybody. Um, <laughs> desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you covenant to give yourself to the fellowship and work of God in connection with it as set forth in our covenant of Christian character, our covenant of Christian conduct of the Church of the Nazarene? And will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, holy service, and be devotedly giving of your means by faithful attendance upon the means of grace and abstaining from all evil? And will you seek to earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and in, the, in a life that's reverence of the Lord? If so, please respond, I will. I will. And then I welcome you into this church, into its sacred fellowship, its responsibilities and privilege. Welcome to the family. <laughs> I'll give you a hug. Welcome. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. It's good to grow the family. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Michael. Well, church, now let's stand and prepare our hearts to worship. Let me, let me pray a prayer as we begin this morning. God, we're thankful that you are in this place. God, we thank you that we can make decisions to follow you, to seek you, no matter what the weather looks like in our landscape, God. We choose to lift you up and to worship you this morning. God, we put everything that's going on in our world outside the door this morning. And in this place, we declare that it is sacred ground. It's where we lift your name, Jesus. It's where we release things to you. It's where we trust you. It's where we express our devotion to you, God, because you are good to your children. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let us worship our living God.
God, we know you're here this morning. We know that you're here to speak to us, and I pray that we can just give everything to you this morning, God, and just worship you with all we are.
just we thank you this morning for the sacrifice we thank you for the life that you gave for us so that we can live a full life with you and we can go into eternity with you lord and we just praise you for that this morning you this morning.
have the power to heal, God. You have the power to heal our bodies and you have the power to heal our hearts and our brokenness. You take our brokenness and you make us whole, Lord. We praise you for that this morning.
it just one more time with just the vocals, just the whole church. Let's just sing it together and declare it to God. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. God, thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you for this moment. And we pray that any chains that are holding us back from you, from having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with you, where we understand you, Lord, we pray that you break those chains and that we know and we have the strength to know that those chains are broken and there's nothing holding us back from you. Pray this in your name. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Except for, if you're an anchor group leader, please come join me up here. Um, should be about eight of us once we all get going here. And as our anchor groups are coming up, uh, you may have seen we've got our sign-ups uh, in the entryway this morning. So afterwards today, we're going to invite all of you to uh, sign up with an anchor group. And... Um, We'll spread out a little bit more. There's a lot. A lot of opportunities. So our anchor groups, um, I'm going to let each each uh, anchor group leader just give a quick little uh, what uh, what their anchor group is, is doing and, and invite you to them. But we touched on it in our Bible study briefly this morning, um, being yoked to one another having a community of like believers around you to encourage you, discipline you. There was about an entire hour conversation on that, but we don't quite have that time right now. And that's what these anchor groups provide, is an opportunity to develop relationships with other like-minded people that are there to support you and grow with you and gives you the opportunity to support others as well. So I'm going to go ahead, I'll sneak down here to the other side, and if we could just, everyone just pass the microphone off. So Chris will go first. Right on. Right on. Okay, good morning church, I'm Chris Dewar, uh, if you don't know me, our uh, anchor group meets on Thursday nights at our home at 7 o'clock, and we go till about 9, we have a quick snack and a fellowship time at the start, then we get into the study, and at the end we have a prayer and uh, praise share time, and then we head on out encouraged uh, to be bold for the next week for Jesus Christ. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm uh, representing the Moreno group. Um, Pastor Mike is actually the leader of this group, but uh, I'm representing that this morning. So uh, we meet at our house on Thursday nights at 630. Um, we're in the same neighborhood, actually, as Chris Stewart. So... Um, uh, uh, we get together and we love our group. The awesome thing that I really love about our group is that it just feels like a, a small family. We really um, bond deeply and we hold each other accountable. And um, we are not only accountability partners, but we're just partners in anchoring deeper into our faith in Christ. And so um, if, you are, if, in, if you are interested, it's also a kid-friendly um, uh, group. <laughs> we have we have kids, so um, you can bring your kids. So anyway, uh, there you have it. I'm going to hand it over to the uh, Mr. Ricardo Garza. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So I'm Ricardo Garza. My wife, Tiffany, down there. And so this is, we're new to the church. So honestly, it's my way to get to know you. <laughs> but secretly, I really do. I want to build community. And uh, my first time ever doing a small group, I did not want to go. Just going to be real. I did not want to do small group. But it was one of the most powerful things. The closest friendships I ever built were in these small groups. And, and there was burdens. I, I just think of scripture when it talks about burdens. I'm not saying when you come to, if you come to our group, I'm just going to share you all my problems. What I'm saying is that we are going to encourage each other and lift each other up. And it is kid-friendly. I know kids can be a burden sometimes. 
amen, but they also are a blessing, and so you could just come and enjoy. If, if you're a kid at heart, you're also welcome. So we, we meet Tuesdays at 6 p.m., so we meet a little bit earlier, and we just live down the street. We'd love to have you and welcome you. I'm Dana Phillips, and I lead the Wednesday morning women, I like to call it WOW, Women of the Word. So we've been, this group's been going on for several years. I kind of took over the leadership of it about a year and a half ago. Talk about friendships and community and fellowship. We actually, because we're women and we like to talk, the first half an hour we dedicate just to talking. And then we get into study. So we've built great friendships. We've had amazing prayer requests. We, it's just been amazing. Um, when I'm not there, I miss it. So if you're a woman, I'm sorry, men. You don't, I just, I'm sorry. You would be uncomfortable. Um, if you're a woman who's available on Wednesday mornings or can be available on Wednesday mornings at 9.30, we meet here at the church, and we are, um, the way I feel like we can get out of our come to church, sit, leave, and not say hello is to get into an anchor group. If you want to build a family, you've got to get to know people. Sunday mornings are great, but anchor groups are the way to get connected. So that's who I am and who we are. Hey, everybody. I'm Jill Goodnight, and I'm not up here because I'm leading an anchor group. I'm actually up here for a experience called Rooted. It's a 10-week experience. It's on Wednesday nights, conveniently the same time as Awana. We'll have it right here at the church, so you can drop your kids off and come on in. Um, I brought notes just in case I got stuck. And speaking of stuck, um, before I started Rooted, I felt stuck. I've been going to church forever, got baptized when I was nine, but I just really felt stuck, and I was not growing, and I was holding back. So about a month ago, I don't know if all, most of you were here, I stood up here and held up a piece of cardboard that said I was holding back before Rooted. And after Rooted, I flipped the card. It said, I'm all in. So if you feel that way, and you would like to spend 10 weeks growing, then go ahead and come sign up in the back. The one other thing I wanted to say is, if you're already in a small group or an anchor group, you can go to that too. Do it two nights a week. That's okay too. And the song today, one last quick thing, the song today about um, breaking chains, we actually go over in the group strongholds. And I know a lot of us have strongholds out there, and we're here in this group to help you break free. Um, Nick, Bobby, Sarah Cunningham, Tracy, did I miss anyone? And El Ellie did it the first time. And we're going to have this about four times a year. But please sign up for this one. Thank you. Um, mine, my group is also not an anchor group. <laughs> um, but the, so it says when you go out to the sign up sheet, it says Young Parents Book Club. Um, but it's not necessarily just that either. Um, so what I want to do is just create a connection group. Sorry, I'm holding two mics. I don't know if that's messing everything up. Um, OK, <laughs> just in case. Um, anyway, um, so our group, what I want to do, if you are a parent of a young child um, from ages 0 to 5, um, we're just going to have a connection group. Um, where we meet maybe once a month. We're just going to see what everybody's schedule is. Uh, I'm going to make like a Facebook group or a group text, whatever works for everybody. But So basically, if you ha are a parent with young kids from that age range, zero to five, you're in that stage of life where it's just really busy and you don't necessarily have time to, um, you know, meet at night or, you know, just whatever it is. We get that it's a crazy schedule um, that, and just like the busy life. And so we're just going to connect and we're going to bring our kids and we're just going to embrace the chaos together because um, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, even people who've had kids, you're like, yes, we get it. Yeah. Anyone who's been in the nursery, like, oh, my gosh, how do parents deal with this every day? Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, so if you're a parent with that zero to five, just put your name on the list. It says Thursday mornings, but what we want to do is just get a group and then say, hey, we're going to do a play date. Everybody meet at the park or we're going to meet at the church and let the kids go in the bounce house. Um, and so we're just going to have community time. Um, so don't be intimidated by the schedule and just sign up. Okay. Good morning. I'm Bill. 
I am not the leader for the Sunday morning 9 o'clock anchor group. Actually, Pastor Michael is, but I, he's asked me to speak on, on our group's behalf. Um, I also, I, and I speak a lot, so uh, I, I kind of fill the role well. I, too, went to my first Bible gra uh, uh, study group, Kicking and Screaming, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, didn't want to do it, but I can tell you that since that first group I attended um, back in Vacaville, um, began a transformation in mine and Rosalie's life um, that's been nothing short of profound. Um, and we have been attending um, life groups, anchor groups, Bible study groups ever since, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I, I remember when we moved from Vacaville to West Sacramento, that particular day was, was a torrential storm. The wind was whipping at 40, 50 miles an hour. It was raining cats and dogs, and we had to move. And every person in our life group, including our pastor, our senior pastor, helped us move that day. I can't tell you how profoundly that touched me. Um, and so, I, you know, we've continued the tradition here. Um, there is no growth, whether it's in your work life or especially your, your spiritual walk, without some degree of uh, discomfort. But you need to subject yourself to that discomfort for the growth to begin. And once it begins, you will never regret a minute of it. I promise you that. So here's my challenge. I dare you. I double dog dare you. This section, this section, that section, that section. I dare you to join a life group today. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I'm not Pastor Nick, but I'll speak on his behalf since he's out there with the children right now. That's why I got my own stand in too, right? Uh, but that's Sunday nights, and that's for the youth. And even uh, Nick's got a really robust schedule um, planned to really start investing in some mentorship and guidance to the youth and, and to really invest time in building a relationship with those youth. So they have somebody, and we all know some of us were youth at one time, that life can get challenging, and, and you we just know that our youth don't always run to their mom or run to their dad when they have a, a really tough time going. And so he's really hoping to fill that gap by being a Christian leader that can be there and listen to them without judgment, but then come back and provide support and encouragement for them too. So if you have children, I encourage you to uh, sign up so he can get you out all the details and they'll be meeting on Sunday night. So while I've got my group up here with some powerful leaders, um, uh, and everything, we want to pray over our offering today as well. Pray over our offering and pray over these anchor groups and pray over the challenge that Bill's thrown out to all of us. So let's go ahead and let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit come in here today and touch every heart that's here. Encourage every heart to find a group to where they can invest into a community of believers just like them, so that they can grow, Lord, and grow closer in community with you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you bless our families as they grow together and strengthen together and live together. And that brings challenges, Lord. And Lord, all this is possible because you have blessed us with this house, your house, where we can come and worship you and give you the glory, Lord, that you so well deserve. And Lord, as we prepare to take these tithes and offerings, we just ask that your blessing go on it and multiply it with the love that is in this house today, Lord. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you. And church, just as we're doing offering um, this morning, you guys can come forward. Um, I just want to... Um, I don't want to encourage you. I'm, I'm going to tell you to do something. Um, in, in the first verse, we're going to sing in Christ alone. And just this morning, what I, I want us to do as a church, do it together as a body of Christ. Um, 
the end of the first verse, so you, you got to pay attention. Um, it says, here in the love of Christ, I stand. And so at that point, if you guys will stand with us after the offering plate's been passed around, just everybody stand. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all and all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on. we thank you for this day. And Lord, we consider the power that we stand in you, Jesus, that we can live our life through your precious blood that brought us into everlasting life, God. Lord, we are just so thankful for what you have given us. And Lord, we continue to just ask that you be with us in this time, 
as we reflect, as we study your word, God, as we continue to find a rhythm in our lives that brings rest for our soul. God, thank you that we can worship you. God, we consider the millions of Christians in the world who don't have the freedom to say your name out loud without fear, fear of persecution, imprisonment, or even death. God, you've given us that freedom. And may we consider it such a joy and such a pleasure to lift your name. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, I'm thankful that we're together again this morning. And this morning I got up really early and I was just thinking about a different time when I woke up really early in the morning. And it was an early rest uh, in this winter time. And I remember I got my gym clothes on. I, um, I, I stumbled in the dark to get my water bottle, my shoes, my headphones, and my, and my keys. And I was determined to get out into the early morning and drive to the gym to keep my commitment not only to myself, but uh, my gym partner, who's another uh, West Sacramento pastor. See, it's not really good to have um, another pastor as your gym partner, because we're all like, oh, it's okay, you didn't make it, full of forgiveness and grace. No, you know, no, we need you to be there. You got to get there, man, you know. So that's the funny thing about that. But driving in the early morning as I, I shook off the sleep and, and, I, and I got myself to the front door, really proud of myself, right, half the time, uh, half the battle is just getting to the place, right, to the gym, uh, or just getting the workout on. And I went to open the door and pulled it, and it didn't open. It was and I realized, like, tomorrow's a holiday, that it was a holiday, and there we go. I couldn't get into the gym. And I'd like to tell you that I didn't let that stop me or my commitment and that I lapped the gym 10 times or did something else, but I went home and went back to bed that day. <laughs> but I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you've made some kind of external commitment and only to find that the place of comfort where you usually do those things or that setting is where you're comfortable is suddenly unavailable or it's closed or shut down. And you know, like I said, I would love to have told you that I kept that commitment, but I didn't that, that morning, and, um, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I could have just worked out anywhere, because you don't need a gym, you don't need all that stuff, you can do it anytime, anywhere, um, and it's nice to have some um, just kind of time with myself to continue to work out and whatnot, and, you know, the thing is, is that uh, the external conditions at times really um, have us compartmentalize when and where we can do things, right? We only will do it if it's the right setting, the right temperature, the right time of day, the right month, if you're wearing the right shoes, whatever it is. We have all these external conditions to do things. And, you know, sometimes we just stop ourselves from integrating our goals like a healthy lifestyle, from reaching all parts of our lives. We compartmentalize it. We keep it really limited and, and whatnot. And as we wrap up our rhythm series today, we're taking a look at worship this morning. And like an activity of working out, worship is also something that for many, many have established it is usually happening at a certain time in a certain place in a certain way. And as we've been seeking to develop a rhythm in our life between work, which was the first week, rest or Sabbath, which we talked about, we also are going to move and think about worship. And we need to examine the patterns to help us get into a rhythm that are part of our day-to-day -day that brings that rest to our soul so that God can use us. And so I wonder... Are we in a pattern of only leaving worship maybe 30 minutes a week if you attend church every week of the month? Because let's just say hypothetically, that's the only time you actively externally worship. And if we look at a month, there's about uh, 720 hours in a month, give or take. And so only two of those hours, we could say, is when we express ourselves where we vocalize outwardly and we have this external demonstration of adoration and praise for God. I don't know if that's if that is the case that seems a little out of balance don't you think? If that's part of the rhythm that we want to build or that God's calling us into and two hours where we release and we receive and we express and we verbalize 
and we seek to demonstrate to God that he is the God on high and that he is most important as far as authority in our lives and he has the power and he has the security of our lives in his keep. And when we stack up the quantities, remember this is hypothetical, it gives us a picture that perhaps there is more to the pattern of worship that brings our life into a rhythm that will produce deeper faith, that will produce rest and security and confidence and a well-being of success, of being a faithful person who loves and follows Jesus. And that's the focus on this series. How do we be about a rhythm of work and rest or Sabbath? I gave a challenge last week, right, about Sabbath? Five hours in your week. I wonder how you did. Did you, did you take the challenge? Did you incorporate five hours of Sabbath? If not, you still can. Don't worry. There's a couple football games later today. And this morning, we're looking at worship and how it draws us deeper into the life where we, where honestly God is calling us to be thriving. And it's where we place our control in his authority when we worship, when we rest in our will and his power, when we praise him, and where we set our fears into his secure care and love for us when we're able to give him that adoration that he is God and we are not. And we can dive deeper into the words of Jesus himself as we read at the tail end in this set of series with his encounter with the Samaritan woman. And in John's gospel in chapter 4, the, the Samaritan woman, when we read her, you read the full narrative of her, she can represent many things for us. But one layer of reading the Samaritan woman is we read that she represents the non-Jewish believers, us. Paul calls us the wild olive branch that's been grafted into God's grace. And so when we read these verses here at the end of chapter 4, we're going to see that Christ is revealing himself to this woman as the Messiah. Not one promised through the Samaritans' teachings or other pagan beliefs, because there was many hopes and wishes that a, a Messiah was coming. But not all of them were focused looking through the Jews, looking for Christ. And this is where we see this, that it's true today that salvation in our world does not come from all these other sources that we can lean ourselves into. They come from a Jewish rabbi who is the Son of God, the one and only way. So let's learn something about the quality of our worship from this, uh, these verses from chapter 4 of John. Verse 22, <clears throat> Jesus says, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet <clears throat> a time is coming, it has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit. And his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Or you could say spirit of truth. That's another interpretation. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. <clears throat> and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. To sum up what God <clears throat> has been teaching me and showing me in this rhythm of life doing this series, which God is so good, he has me live it out before I preach it. So that's a, a testimony that he loves you and he wants us all to walk in an authentic walk. That's a value of our church, authenticity. But he's been having me walk with the rhythm of worship is a practice that is internal and it's integrated. Ever have that word come up in life? How do we integrate this? How do we connect this? I mean, we are so tempted to look at the qualities in our life with just external practice or what we do and the concentration of time and energy and resources that yield or produce some kind of external outcome. For example, if you spend time developing a skill, like calligraphy, for example, you may not have the best raw skill to do that, but you're gonna, if you spend time, you get the right material, you get the right pen, you write paper, ink, everything, you develop that time, you put practice into it and resources 
over time, you're going to see with all that external input some kind of hopefully progression of outcome, right? That's the hope. It seems that we're a little more realistic in our lives, <clears throat> in our expectations, that if you spend little time, you'll get little results. If you eat a Snickers bar right after your workout, you're not going to see a lot of progression in your phys physical uh, transformation, right? Yet it seems that we have a, a different equation when it comes to look at our encounter with worship. We can look at the external activity of our, or our effort and how at times we segregate it or compartmentalize it into such a small amount of our month. Say it only is two hours a month that we do express worship to God out of the 720. Yet we seem to want that to have that tremendous potency in our lives and our outlook and our maturing faith. Why is that? Why do we seem to limit our input or devotion to not realize greater outcomes in our faith? We have to internalize it. We have to integrate it in all facets, all areas, all ways we live our lives. Worship can't just be this time. Once a month, twice a month, three times a month, four times a month. We need to have it internally practiced and integrated with all that's going on. And I do have complete faith, though. I want to make stress this as well. I have complete faith that we often step into God's grace at times when our devotion is limited, when it is stifled, or maybe it's dormant in us. God is just so gracious with us because I want to make sure I'm not preaching a performance gospel. It's not a performance gospel. I am not preaching that. I'm just wanting to emphasize that I think maybe we need to consider if we want to have a rhythm that gives us eternal rest, it has, we have to have internal practice and we have to integrate it in all parts of our lives. But I want to consider today and I want you to kind of reflect on the fact that a lot of the church in Western society today has segregated worship into blocks in time particular moments of external demonstration rather than a hunger to promote it internally and to have it come into contact with all parts of their lives each and every day. It's so interesting that when we see the church in the oppressed or the persecuted countries, we usually find the most devoted. We usually find them to be most fervent or pious or, or just willing to integrate worship in all parts of their life. I think we can learn a lot from our brothers and sisters in that area. And Christ tells us in these verses who are the true worshipers. It isn't those who have optimal external evidence. It's not those of us who are comfortable raising our hands, closing our eyes, coming to the altar, hitting our knees. Those are wonderful things. But it isn't those who accomplish a reading plan early in the morning or a devotional book. It isn't if your Bible is highlighted with five different highlighter colors or you don't have it full of old bulletins with copious amounts of sermon notes on it. Those are wonderful things. Those are amazing things. But those are still all external things. They still can leave us isolated from the work of the gospel inside in our hearts, in our minds. They still can be at a surface level and only letting so much of the truth penetrate our hearts and change it. It's the difference, I think, when someone says, I'm not on a diet, I'm, on, I'm in a lifestyle. You know, our family now isn't on a diet. Our family is on a lifestyle because certain realities are never going to change in our world. So we can't think that it's temporary. We have to make a lifestyle change so that it produces the best outcome. It's the same for our faith. It isn't a diet of consuming the truth four out of five mornings in your work week or, or practicing a habit. It is a style that produces, it's a pattern that's internal that produces a life that's separate from all the other ways a person can live and build their eternal future. 
The true worshipers that Jesus says are those who worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. They worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'd like to answer that for you. Because when we look at these words, spirit and truth, they're intangible. They aren't something that we can grasp. They aren't something that we can lift up in, on a shelf. It would be easier if Jesus said, God is seeking those who worship by perfect attendance 52 weekends out of 52 weeks, right? Then we'd be like, okay, that's all I got to do. I just got to show up. I just got to be present. I just got to check a box. I just got to, I don't know, write an attendance sheet entry or something like that. But that's not what it's saying here. That would be just so much easier, I think, for us. But God is interested in something a little more internal so that you're prepared to step into the eternal plan that he has for you. And so this is what happens here. We have to realize that it isn't, we're not in a relationship with something that is tangible. We're in a relationship with someone that's intangible because God is spirit. God is spirit. You ever think about that? Consider that? God is spirit. God is not luck. God is not fate. God is not karma. God is not the random acts of kindness. And God is not this nameless, voidless universe that you're told to put yourself in the center of. That's not God. God is spirit. So if God is spirit, God is the truth, then it means that God holds all the authority. God has the authority. Only God is holy. Only God is righteous. And only God is the judge. We like to put ourselves in that seat, but a lot of the times God's gracious enough to remind us that's not our role. And God is power. God has the power. He resurrected his son from the dead. He beat death so that we could have life. And finally, God is the creator. God creates, he restores and creates in us a new heart, a new person, a new life, and a new mission. So that is who we are worshiping. So the question comes down to, <clears throat> how open to the Spirit are you? How do you sit before God waiting for his work to reveal truth in your walk? in your decisions, in your thinking, in your plans, and in the output of what you are able and not able to do. How open are you? And when Jesus talks about spirit, it's that same spirit that when you put faith in Christ, it gives you the gift of the spirit that's to be used for the church and to build the witness of Christ in your world. When you step into faith, when you step into worshiping God and honoring him with that decision of your life, then you are given a gift, the Holy Spirit. And it manifests differently among us. For some, we're given the gift of faith. Some of us, the gift of wisdom to discern. Some of us, the gift of prophecy. And others, the gift of healing. And the truth is that there is one God that you are fashioned in hope, you're not a mistake, that you are beloved, you have a name, that, you, that there is salvation for your soul, and all the law of God and the prophecies and the prophets are summed up, fulfilled in, and realized in your life and for the world in Jesus Christ alone. So when that becomes part of your internal life, what you think about, what you hope for, what you plan for, what you consider when a decision comes your way. We have the eternal call on us, as Jesus states, in the spirit and in truth, to worship God, to give it to him, decisions and worries and wills and wants and opportunities and challenges, so that no matter what quantity of the ideal life you're living in right now, whether we have it all or we barely have a thread of it, when we, if we can hold on to that internal life of integrating worship all the time, it doesn't erode why we worship God. 
Because our internal posture of worshiping him through spirit and truth are revealing the qualities of God and they are to be praised no matter the circumstances. I don't know what is working and not working in your life right now, but regardless of them, God is worthy of your praise. God is worthy to be adored, to be held up on high, to be the center of your life. And the truth is to be realized and revealed at all moments of life, not when the doors of the church are open all the time. So what do we need to do? Well, when it comes to worship, we must stop focusing just on the external efforts to mask the condition of the internal. But no matter where and when, we need to willingly encounter the spirit that is eternal, to step into that purpose, to bring that pattern in our life so that there's a rhythm of worship regardless of what's going on in our rests and our work and our relationships. Thus, the most important factor in becoming a worshiper is to guard and cultivate your heart for God. You have to guard and you got to cultivate. You got to protect and you got to promote. Those are the things that you can do as a disciple of Jesus. You have to guard your heart from false truth. You got to cultivate the trustworthiness of a God when you're walking through hard times. That's what we are called to do. And this is to be the pattern of your life as you develop a rhythm of worship. Your heart is to be connected to the Spirit as you guard against shallow, empty expressions of faith that don't have any love in them, no adoration or surrender to them. And you are called to invest what you've been given, what season you're in, no matter what season you're in, to invest and plant and tend and give attention to the ways that you give glory to God on high, to Jehovah, to Yahweh, right? How are you maybe are not satisfied right now with the limitations and expectations you put on your worship? You know, I grew up in a pretty, I didn't grow up, but I grew up, came to faith in a pretty conservative church. And then the church after that was very expressive, and I was freaked out. Oh, you raised your hands? What is that? <clears throat> Heard somebody mumbling in the corner. They weren't mumbling, right? They were praying out loud. I'm like, what is that? All of us have, <clears throat> I would say, a background and a heritage, and, and we come from different threads of expressing ourselves to God. And I think at times we let those examples or those experience limit us in our worship. We don't ask our heart, how do we willingly step into freedom to express worship? We let the conditions, we let the noise or the lights or the, the sound of, the, you know, we let all these external things determine how we are welling up inside and giving devotion to God. It's not about whether we're singing an old or new song. It's not about whether there's a bass guitar or not. It's not about that. It's about whether we are willing to integrate worship in our lives and not be limited by our own limitations but to draw into a place of complete freedom to worship God. We're to praise the Lord when we rise, when we lay our head at night, lift him up, seek to adore him, <clears throat> contemplate his love for you and for the world that you're called to love because of him. Honor him by the reply you give to those who are the most different than you and the most difficult to love. Show that it doesn't matter that you're going to worship God by the way you are loving them. Whether it's in your work, whether it's in your household, whether it's in our church family here, encounter the Spirit by identifying how openness to God no longer has any boundaries in your life. God, take down my walls. Let me be vulnerable and free to worship you how you lead me to. Build that rhythm of worship by the pattern of guarding it from being an only a part of your life and cultivating it by being a person who can find new ways to bring worship in. I don't know if you don't know if there's other ways to bring worship in. There's lots of ways to bring worship into your DNA. 
<clears throat> and I felt like I needed to bring some this morning. How to bring different pathways to integrate worship in your life. And I'm going to bring you 12 right now. <clears throat> Here are 12 ways that you can integrate worship into your life. And I would ask God to point out three to you to start practicing. The first one is to be a naturalist with God. Love God outdoors. This is one of my top three. Meditate on God's majesty while going on a hike or walking down a dirt road. Be inspired by the skies and the trees and the rocks. And if we don't praise him, they will, as the scripture says. Worship God by the, your senses, loving him with your senses. Make art as an act of worship, even if it's just a sketch. Absorb worship music, different types of worship music. Pray in various positions, standing and sitting and kneeling and dancing and laying on your face or, or walking. Traditionalists, loving God through ritual and symbol. Read scripture out loud. Do it. Use the Book of Common Prayer. It's online. It's really easy to find. Meet with God at the same time in the same place every day. I know there's some of you who have a war room in your closet. That's amazing. That's good. We need you prayer warriors. Study church history. Look at what our, our church fathers and sisters did. What sacrifices they made. What risk they took to praise. Practice taking prayer breaks throughout the day. Then there's aesthetics, loving God in solitude and simplicity. Fast, skip a meal, and in that mealtime pray. Rise up early in the morning for prayer. In the stillness of the dark, look for God. Practice heart clean cleaning, where you ask the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to reveal sins and when he does, confess them. Confession, confession to God is a beautiful act of worship to him. Don't be afraid of it. Activists, loving God through confrontation. Make a list of God's characteristics that you want to grow into. Pray for your city. Pray for your street. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for our state. Write your congressman or congresswoman. And maybe pray and ask them to release persecuted Christians around the world. Caregivers, loving God by serving others. Open your home to some of our students or another person in our church. Offer counseling in order to support at a local crisis or pregnancy center. Join our prayer team and pray for our congregation. Enthusiasts, loving God with mystery and celebration. Still your heart and listen to God. Write down what you hear him saying. Act out Bible stories with your kids. Seek a prayer partner and be consistent. Contemplatives, loving God through adoration. Read a psalm and pray it and put your name in it or say I in it. Pick a verse and meditate on it while you close your eyes and breathe deeply. Study artistic traditions of biblical stories and meditate on that story. Allow yourself to feel it and see it illustrated. Intellectuals, loving God with the mind. Get a good commentary. There's a lot online. And read a passage to and gain broader understanding of what scholars understand about what's going on there. Find other Christians who are interested in ethics and doctrine and, and discuss what you believe. Listen to sermons or podcasts. If you're an introvert, loving God by yourself, keep a list of daily blessings in your life. Pray through the fruit of the Spirit each week, a different one, and cultivate that characteristic in yourself. If you're an extrovert, love God in community and with others. If you say you're going to pray with someone or for them, actually do it. Follow up with them. Offer to host a Bible study or be a mentor or accountability partner to someone, older or younger, it doesn't matter. And then VAC, which means our different uh, learning styles, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Read, listen, draw, watch, get involved, 
There's so many ways that you can integrate worship. Amen? There's a lot here. And we're made so complex with so many different ways to appreciate God. Don't limit it to just two hours a month at most. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says this, <clears throat> whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all Amen. for his glory. And he made you in a particular way. And he probably made you in that particular way so that you could worship him. And with all these ways and more, the hope and the outcome of why we do this is the same as it was for the Samaritan woman. When Jesus declared to her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. In that connecting with God in these ways, in various ways, in new ways, in traditional ways, is the same result of Jesus being revealed into your life. That's the hope. That God shows up. That he reveals himself to you. That you encounter him over and over again. And in these patterns of worship, no matter where our days take us, no matter if a door is locked or closed or open, May nothing stop us from guarding and cultivating, protecting and promoting your heart of worship. Because when you do that, it leaves you forever changed. If you are a worshiper of God in spirit and truth, you will be eternally known by God and you will be completely redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So I pray that these patterns of worship do more for us as we seek to bring work and rest and praise into harmony with God as our lives unfold. I'm going to invite the worship team back up as we close our service this morning. And as we live out together as a faith community, may the rhythm that we live be life-giving and may the result be a collection of people here who serve and labor and rest and praise from a full place. Not, not just a full place, actually an overflowing place. Because what happens when it overflows in you? It spills onto other people. They're affected because you're in that full overflowing place. And I pray that this series, you have all that you need to learn to be in a rhythm that gives rest for your soul. Next week, we're going to be starting a new series. It's called How to Study the Bible. That's a good series. If you struggle with how to study the Bible, then this series is for you. And I'm excited to dive into it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray now. And if you need prayer, the prayer, uh, the prayer lounge is open. And so uh, pre please go back there and receive some prayer. And then we're going to close our worship with our last song. Let's pray, church. Jesus, we thank you for this day. <clears throat> Lord, we that you've given us so many ways to worship you. God, I pray that we can be a people that protects our hearts and cultivates a joy and a desire to know you, to worship you, to see all those different pathways that I just read. Maybe there's something we can try today and we find you show up in it. You just completely rearrange the way we look at worship. God, it's, it's for you. We seek to adore our lives in every every compartment, every facet, every season, every day of the week. May we be people that worship you in spirit and in truth. God, bless my brothers and sisters. May they continue to live for you. May they, may they hunger and thirst for righteousness. And God, continue to bless them. And may your mercies follow them all the days of their lives, Jesus. And God, as we go out, as we sign up for anchor groups, as we connect as new people in the Compass class, and beyond. May we continue to be your people that demonstrate that we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing song together.
chain, break every chain. There is power. you this morning before we head out to just leave your chains here leave them here so God can take them away anything that is a burden to you just leave it here and walk out free in Jesus and if you need prayer to help get rid of that burden um, we have Tiffany in the back to pray over you just whatever's going on in your life if you need someone to talk to um and, and receive that prayer if, if it feels like it's too tough. But pray you guys have a great Sunday and let's go out and sign up for some anchor groups. Thank you guys.